Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this session, Novel Electronics Shielding for Space Electronics to Optimize SWAP. We are honored to have here Professor Robert Hayes uh, from the Nuclear Engineering Department from North Carolina State University. And now uh, we're going to listen to him with a lot of attention. So thank you very much, Professor Hayes. Hey, hope everybody's doing good. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the results from uh, my latest PhD student uh, who just defended this past summer in terms of some novel ways to uh, make commercial off the shelf electronics radiation hard. So it starts with recognizing what it is that, uh, what are the criteria to put radiation electronics, or any kind of PC board into space? You gotta have a conformal coat on it. The conformal coat is basically a thin layer of polymer. <clears throat> Now, one of the things that that presents is it's not just water, but it prevents the creation of whiskers. You can see whiskers growing on this PC board right here. And those will be caused by things like very small metal fines that can be created when you assemble uh, a package to put on a, a satellite because you're going to be screwing screws into things. And anytime that metal slides on metal, you're going to create very fine metal particulate which on terrestrial systems isn't a big deal in general, but in space where you don't have water for adhesion and you have no gravity and you have a lot of thermal oscillations, uh, these things can start to float around and they will follow, these metal, metal fines will follow and the electrical lines of, of force, which will end on a terminal of uh, a component, which can cause a short. And so therefore the, the conformal coat prevents those whiskers from growing and it provides a hermetic seal. When it comes to radiation shielding, there are a number of issues to deal with, and that's gonna be the radiation field that you get depending on the type of orbit that you're in, whether you're in a geostationary, uh, mid-Earth or low Earth orbit, you're gonna get different radiation fields primarily from the sun. Now, because they, there is a very different mass uh, between protons and electrons, you're gonna get these different Van Allen belts where the outer belt is going to be dominated by electrons and the inner belt, inner belt is going to be dominated by protons. And this, this, these things are cyclic with the solar cycle as well. And you're going to get different distributions of all of these, but you're going to get dominant uh, radiation types in the specific orbitals. And it can get really complicated if you're in a polar orbital as well. So you've got to take into consideration shielding if you want these things to withstand the radiation uh, harshness that you get out in outer space. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of damage that can occur to electronics when you are subjecting it to high radiation fields of different radiation types. Uh, the dominant ones will be displacement damage. This can be like a galactic cosmic ray punching a hole through something. Uh, total ionizing dose. This can come from, say, the electrons and the X-rays just giving a, a very large dose to something. And then single event effects. These can be, again, galactic cosmic rays uh, or uh, uh, high energy protons coming from the solar wind. And depending on the type of damage is gonna de de determine what kind of uh, structure you need for your electronics to make them radiation hard. And that's without any kind of shielding. So let's look at some options for shielding. So what we've done is we've taken the conformal coat and we've infused it with high Z metal oxides. So those would be things like erbium, gadolinium, and tungsten. And you can see samples of these here that when we started, this is my PhD student. Uh, he actually is graduating now, so is Dr. Hansen. Uh, and so we started looking, can you create a cost-effective shield that will give you radiation hardness that will optimize the size, weight, and power requirements for electronics? Turns out the answer is yes. Um, but one of the big challenges that we had getting there was meeting the NASA or the mill standard specifications for uh, a product that has no bubbles. Now, when you infuse this metal oxide, you can see the powder up here to the right and you can put it inside of a, a material. And here we're measuring its viscosity and you can do it under vacuum as shown here to try to remove all of the bubbles. And there were a number of iterations that we had to go through. We've already got a patent applied because once we've, uh, uh, we, a patent's already been issued and another one uh, has just been submitted because we're finally able to get these without bubbles, fully homogenous. And you can see this is actually two layers put on top of each other. So we get full adhesion 
using our patented uh, 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 process to infuse the uh, standard commercial off the shelf conformal coat material that meets all the NASA specs, but to, uh, to, to get it to still meet those specifications, uh, once you've infused it with high Z metal oxides. Now, the reason why we use oxides is because it makes it so that it's non-conductive. It's an insulator. So you don't get issues that can come, say, with, um, with the whiskers. And with this, we had to measure the, uh, uh, the radiation attenuation properties. You see here the standard Lambert beer law. Uh, you can also cast that into equivalent forms of the 10th value layer, the half value layer, but we really just focus on measuring the linear and mass uh, absorption co uh, coefficient. So the linear attenuation coefficient is the mu for the material, and then you've got a density, and the density is going to be a function of the metal oxide content. And so you can calculate what the theoretical values need to be. We measured these to verify that we had the properties that we expected using a portable high purity germanium gamma ray spectrometer. We would do that by taking a europium source that's got lots of energies, so you can measure the attenuation properties of a wide range of energies doing this. And you put the <clears throat> you put the source underneath the, the, the shield. <coughs> Sorry, you put the source underneath the shield and you measure it as seen here. So we validated the whole process by using a known material. This is just aluminum. So we did a bunch of aluminum at different thicknesses and showed. Oh, look. Pretty straightforward to measure the mass energy absorption coefficient of aluminum. What was really of interest is when we're looking at the mixed oxides. So you can see the shielding properties of just the pure Rioflex uh, or erythane, the pure um, uh, polymer material. But you can see this is a logarithmic plot. Once you put uh, for this for the same weight, you get a massive increase in the amount of shielding at low energies. And this happens across the board. It's because you've got a high Z metal oxide present in there. And you can see that the measurement versus the uh, theoretical work just fine. And so everything uh, is consistent. Uh, the measurement verification uh, was uh, at valid. So now it's time to do some testing. So one of the tests that we did was at a high energy linear accelerator. Now, the reason why we wanted to look at this is this characterizes potential uh, uh, high energy galactic cosmic rays uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum. Here, we don't expect the, the stuff to work, but we wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that funny was going on that was unexpected. Because when you're when you're dealing with really high energies, <clears throat> say 10 MeV and above, you can start to induce uh, nuclear effects. You can actually, you start to have enough energy to knock protons and neutrons out of the nucleus. And so you can do some funny stuff. So we did some testing there. Uh, what we used for testing were Raspberry Pis. So basically all the testing that was done or these Raspberry Pis. These are basically cheap commercial off the shelf electronics so that you can basically program any standard robot using one of these. It's got memory, it's got uh, a, a central processor, it's got IO, uh, it's got all the features that you would need to do basic computation or operations. Now, what we're interested in uh, are basically connectivity can you talk to it? Uh, is the are the power is the power there? And then we want to look at how fast it would process. So if I'm if I'm running this Raspberry Pi, we did this with these things operating. The tests were done real time with the uh, the, the chip. Uh, the, the boards were completely operating, so that we were running Linpack, which will test how fast it can do computations. We were running uh, uh, Whetstone. Um, to, uh, oh, sorry, I got that back. The, the K-flops is how fast it processes. The whetstone is, it can it properly process? Uh, and then Memtester for random access. So we're testing IO, we're testing memory, and we're testing computational power. All the things that would be standard for a computer that would be running any kind of operation on a satellite, testing them real time uh, with, with both shielded and unshielded. Now for the LINPAC, we didn't see a whole lot of uh, 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 change. Uh, what we saw is a small, very, a, a small improvement with the shielding, which is all that was expected. What was interesting is that there was some recovery. Uh, after six months, there was, uh, there was improvement in the capability of the boards uh, when we're look, looking at those K-flops for the computation prop, uh, uh, capability. What was far more of interest is the utility at uh, more moderate energy. So this is going to be done with, the, the, this testing was done with the Cobalt 16. Here's the uh, Dr. Hansen again, uh, putting the Raspberry Pis, outfitting them, hooking them up to uh, our uh, oscilloscope so that we can again do all of the testing during irradiation. So all these tests are going to actually have powered boards 
operating within uh, 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 the radiation field continually taking place. So what we saw with the, this is the unshielded results for unshielded results with the Raspberry Pis. You can see that basically the process for the most part, it was pretty consistent. Now with dose, there were some outliers where you could see that the processing did was degraded uh, as you went, but the bulk of the uh, performance from the Raspberry Pi was largely independent, going up to uh, uh, 50 KRADs. Now let's get things a little more interesting. Now let's look at uh, exposure from a nuclear reactor. Now this is interesting because what we saw with the photons is just that, high energy photons, but now we're going to be looking at high energy neutrons. The high energy neutrons are going to simulate uh, protons in the sense that the way that neutrons deposit energy in a material when they're irradiating it is through recoil. Uh, that's the dominant mechanism, especially if you've got any hydrogenous material in there, then you're going to get uh, like billiard balls, uh, neutrons scattering off of protons. It's largely just kinematics. There are no excited states of a proton to have any kind of inelastic scatter. So you really only get elastic scatter with protons. And like with billiard balls, on average, any interaction will give up half its energy. So a 2 MeV pro, uh, sorry, a 2 MeV, 2 MeV neutron will on average create a 1 MeV proton where they, they both scatter off with an MeV of energy. And so you can create high energy protons with this. Now, if you're dealing with things that are uh, nuclei that are a little bit bigger, like say uh, carbon, then it's a lot less. You're going to get a lot less uh, uh, LET from that recoiling carbon nucleus if you had an elastic scatter. Plus, you also have the option of doing inelastic scatters as well. And so you get a lot of different kinds of radiation damage with the neutrons, but the uh, metal oxide infused conformal coat has a very measurable improvement uh, when you are a, a very large improvement when it comes to shielding. But all of these results right here that we're going to be showing are the unshielded results. So how do we do this? To start off with, you got to know what the flux is. What is the energy distribution of the neutrons? Over here on the right, you see what prompt neutrons that are created from fission, what they look like. And then what's of interest is what is the equivalent neutron fluence that you would get for, say, a 1 MeV neutron fluence? And so you've got to use this, this function right here, and then you got to fold that in to this flux calculation so that when you know what your, uh, your, your response, <clears throat> when you know what your response function is, Professor, sorry for interrupting, but we're not seeing your presentation. Uh, do you want to share? You're kidding. I've been doing this whole time. And you haven't seen the presentation? No. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. This is sorry. a great presentation. I thought you were introducing the, but yeah, but you can share it now. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. Well, so before, um, in the, before I came on, uh, we were having a problem get, doing a full screen, getting the full screen on there. And uh, and so we went with the partial screen. Okay, let me just stop sharing. And now it's acting weird, it's not coming up. Uh, I don't know. Do you want oh, to you missed a lot of great stuff. So, her, so I, you wanna, screen, yeah. I can send you my email and you can send it to me and I'll share it. Do you want to try that? Uh, yeah, this is really a shame. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not coming up in my window. Maybe if I left and came back in, it would reset. I don't know. Maybe that's easier way to go. But then the, the recording will be interrupted. Okay. Uh, well, how do I stop sharing? It looks like it's not letting me even stop sharing. In the, in the bottom, uh, the share button doesn't work. It's as it's, it's lit as though I'm sharing, but it's not letting me unshare. Maybe you're not sharing anything. Then the, then the button shouldn't be lit. Mm, mine is lit too, and I'm not sharing. Oh, well, then I don't know what's going on. Oh, yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, so it's not coming up. My my PowerPoint window is not coming up as an option to share. Oh, there it is. Now it came up. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, 
Okay, so you can see it now? Yes. Great. All right, well, here's the whiskers I tried to show you. Here's the conformal coat. Here's the, uh, the, the different orbits, the solar wind and the different uh, Van Allen belts, solar cycles, the different types of radiation damage that can occur. Here are the different samples of metal oxide in the conformal coat, the gadolinium, erbium, and tungsten. Is the, are the slides pro uh, progressing? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing it. Ah, all right, so here you see us making our testing. There's the metal oxide powder. There's the actual uh, polymer. This is what it looks like when we finally got uh, them to be able to stick together. You can barely see the line there, but that's the point. You can barely see the line. You got basically perfect adhesion with no bubbles, a material with no bubbles, and full homogeneity. That's what we patented. Uh, the uh, Lambert Beer Law for radiation attenuation. Uh, the, this is the actual experimental configuration where we're taking europium source with these energy lines down here and putting it underneath the uh, high period germanium detector to uh, measure radiation attenuation. Uh, there's the benchmarking where we're using aluminum plates to demonstrate that it works as expected for aluminum plates. And then here's when we're testing the actual conformal coat, the measurements, you can see the difference the, the, uh, between for the lower energy x-rays how much better uh, radiation attenuation it is because you've got the high Z metal oxide present. There's the high energy linear accelerator, the Raspberry Pis we're using, the shielding configurations with the uh, Linac. Uh, here's the examples of the tests that we were, we were doing, the ones for processing speed, for IO speed, and for memory. Uh, for being able to put memory to a, a board, there's a, a copy, a, a picture of one of the raspberry, <clears throat> one of the raspberry pies we actually used. Here's the actual test results. You can see shielded and unshielded here. There's a little bit of difference, but not much. And then you got a little bit of recovery after that. So you can see there is some improvement as you go. It's not a lot. It just didn't make a whole lot of difference with the at the at the really high energy photon range. Uh, here's the actual configuration with the cobalt sixty source. Uh, where my student is outfitting the Raspberry Pi. So the, the slides are advancing, right? You can see all of this still? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, and uh, here's the actual experimental configuration um, uh, before it went down and got irradiated. And there's the oscilloscope showing uh, connectivity. Uh, here are the results um, where you can now see that uh, the performance uh, of the Raspberry Pi for the whetstone test largely was independent of dose. You can see that there's a number of outliers that grew in as dose increased. But for the most part, uh, the, the performance was uh, uh, consistent with uh, not being irradiated, which is a big surprise. And this is just commercial off the shelf Raspberry Pi. Uh, this, uh, all of these have been, were, were at the time they'd been submitted, but most of them have actually been accepted for publication now. Some of them have been published. Uh, this is the reactor that we actually did our testing in. We did it with two different uh, uh, memory memory disks. Uh, and again, one of the Raspberry Pi is used in the testing for the nuclear reactor. Uh, and then this is where I was when I was informed that you had been seeing all those wonderful slides showing all this fun research that we did here. Uh, this on the right is the spectrum uh, prompt fission. Uranium-235 is what we used in our reactor. So this is the neutron distribution. This is a semi-log plot. This is the response function that you're required to use. It's from the ASTM standard in order to get one MeV equivalent neutron flux. That's what you need to look at in order to get, uh, in order to do uh, the, the NASA standard testing for radiation hardness. Um, in order to attain the, the, the spectrum that we expected, basically this fast fission spectrum, we had to put the sources, uh, the samples in this cadmium sleeve. The cadmium sleeve basically just removes all of the uh, thermal neutrons. So the only thing that gets in is just really that prompt neutron spectrum. This is the actual configuration that we use to do the testing. Uh, this is just a little polyethylene uh, sleeve to fit everything down into the reactor. This is the tube that it went down into. This is a cross-sectional view uh, schematic, uh, what it looked like while it was down and in there for the testing. All right, so now for some of the fun stuff. 
Um, so there are two different types of uh, memory chips that, that we use, the standard and the extreme. Um, what was of interest is that if we use the extreme, that they recovered. Uh, and so with that recovery, uh, you can see that, uh, that there was a difference just in, in what you choose for your commercial off the shelf, that different commercial off the shelf components will have different amounts of radiation hardness as demonstrated uh, in this testing right here. Now here's some really interesting physics that none of us expected. Um, that was a big surprise. Now in the past, uh, uh, when people would model uh, particulate in an uh, uh, homogeneous matrix of any any sort, they, you would generally use uh, you would put the particulate in a crystal lattice, so that uh, in doing the Monte Carlo modeling, you basically have your little your little metal oxide particles in some kind of a homogeneous uh, matrix, and then you'll do your Monte Carlo to transport the radiation through that. Now. That begs the question, if these particulate have special radiation attenuation properties, is there going to be a difference in the Monte Carlo model values compared to measured? Because in measured values, these particulate are going to be random. So does that change the radiation attenuation properties of the material if the particulate are in a crystal lattice or if they're just randomly distributed like an amorphous material? That's what one would expect. And so this research showed that there was indeed an effect and that the, the an amorphous uh, distribution is going to give you different radiation attenuation properties than the crystal lattice. And that's attributed to the fact that uh, the, 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 uh, the resin here, the polymer, has very low attenuation properties. And so these uh, uh, high Z metal oxide particulate they basically just cast a shadow. And so the, when I stack these up, there'll be a bunch of attenuation there, but there's really no attenuation through these sides. You have basically have radiation streaming through the sides because you you choose to model it as a crystal lattice instead of amorphous material, where if it's amorphous, you're going to get some particulate in almost any path that you go, giving you uh, a, a equivalent radiation attenuation through any path and that it, it, it doesn't average out. And that's what this result found. And the way that we checked that is we did a regular crystal lattice and then we were able to turn the crystal lattice and <clears throat> do the radiation attenuation with a turned crystal lattice or having a crystal lattice where the partic particulate were randomly perturbed inside the crystal lattice. And so there's the question, is, the, is there going to be any difference in the calculated radiation attenuation properties when you go through any of these? Because when we did our validation, where I showed you earlier, where we validated the radiation transport with the calculated values, what was done is that we assumed that the, the stuff was homogenous. So we actually didn't have the particulate in there. We just homogenized the thing, which is what you would get with an amorphous material, a better approximation. And there was no difference there between calculated values and measured values. And what we found here, I'm about to show you, is that we did see uh, a difference between calculated and measured values if you use this approach. And that's given here in this table. So that you can see up here at these higher energies, one uh, 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 half an MeV up to one MeV, there really isn't any difference between all of the different models. But if you get down to these lower energies, say 100 keV, you can see if I'm doing rotation or non-rotation, right? That was one of the things we had, rotation and non-rotation. If I go between rotation and, uh, uh, and non-rotation, there's a big difference. Uh, if I use the homogeneous values, which we used in the beginning, that agrees with the theoretical NIST values perfectly. But if I do a 30 degree or a 30 degree around X and Y, and I start turning these in different directions, I start to approach the NIST values, but I still never get there. And it's not until I get up to these higher energies that it doesn't make a difference anymore. And so what that's telling us is that these high Z metal oxides, they're, they're very powerful at attenuating low energy photon or beta, but they're not so great at attenuating gamma. They don't make a whole, a whole uh, uh, big difference at really high energy photons. They only make a big difference at low energy photons, which is where you now see a difference. And so that was a big, a, a big discovery for us. The biggest in, uh, thing to industry uh, and where industry is, uh, is finding this of interest isn't in terms of the physics of uh, this uh, matrix, which I just showed you, but in terms of swap. So, and that was the last chapter, and that's what we're going to go over now, is how did we optimize the size, weight, and power? 
And so there are two things you can do. You can do this. You can use the old Terrace model from NASA that models the spectrum that you get in outer space. And we had two models. We're running when you have the, the standard aluminum. So as a general rule, when I put a electronics in space, it's going to have an aluminum box. And so you can model the standard aluminum box at a nominal thickness of about or nominal distance of about a centimeter. So you assume that it's got a centimeter away uh, or you can get the same aerial density with the MOIC and how much improvement in swap does that give? So in other words, you're saying I'm, I'm going to commit to the same aerial density. And when you do that, you can ask a number of things. You can say, all right, so if all I'm going to do is to replace uh, my um, uh, my aluminum with the metal oxide of the, uh, the same thickness, then I get a large dip in the mass, but uh, with, even with the same total aerial density, but I don't get a change in the dose. It doesn't really change the dose. It just lowers the mass if I do that. Uh, to get the same amount of radiation shielding from uh, uh, the MOIC as I get from the aluminum. Then I can get rid of a lot of mass if I just say I want the same amount of shielding with aluminum. If in, in turn I decide, no, I want actually a lot more shielding, I'm going to have a much higher aerial density, something on the order of about two or three times, then I get a bigger penalty for the mass, but now my annual dose goes down by, oh, uh, oh, over a factor of two. So if I'm willing to accept a mass penalty, I can reduce the dose. If I don't want to take a mass penalty, then uh, then I can, or if I don't want to take a dose reduction, then I can just reduce the mass. So you can have a trade-off there in terms of the shielding effectiveness for uh, relative to the aluminum versus the moit. And these were done at what, uh, the, the left graph shows for a thousand kilometers and then the right graph is at 2000 kilometers. But you can see that you can get drastic reductions in the dose uh, if you use the MOIC as, a pair, as opposed to using aluminum for your shielding. So in conclusion, uh, this is his dissertation and, and this is the link to his dissertation. Uh, we have shown that you can do NASA compliant materials that will give you uh, either a drastic reduce, reduction in dose with a mass penalty uh, or you can keep the mass at the same and get uh, 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 or keep the, the dose the same, but do a, a, a drastic reduction in the mass. And so there's a trade off that you can have. And the idea is that if you can make radiation hard components uh, with commercial off the shelf boards, then that will substantially improve your supply chain and it will substantially improve the, uh, the reliability that you can get components because now they're gonna be cheap, a lot cheaper. Radiation hard components can be many orders of magnitude more expensive than, than traditional commercial off-the-shelf components. And so it just gives the, uh, the designer of the satellite electronics uh, many more options because now you can take commercial off-the-shelf items and uh, give them the radiation hardness they need to survive a, a, a space mission. So. Questions? Is everybody still there? That put uh, you to I'm sleep. Here, I'm here. <laughs> um, do we have any questions? Uh, if not, the recording will be uh, on the platform, and people will be able to to see it at, at other moments, and uh, and maybe they can contact you or. Uh, Okay. Do you have uh, your email here? Or... Um, I don't think so. It's uh, rb. I can put it in the in the chat. R b h a y e s at ncsu.edu. Okay. Uh, oh, here there's a comment. Uh, impressive research, Richard Mosam says, and we can see your email. Yeah, and, and your conference will be stored uh, there at the PSO platform for people to be consulting it at other moments. Okay. But we, we thank you for your participation and your presentation. And, and hopefully we'll see you around. <laughs> thank you, Professor Hayes. Thank you. Bye-bye.